Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, presented by Cooper Tires. This episode, we are paying tribute to the late and great Al Holbert, who was killed 30 years ago today, Sunday, September 30th, 1988, in a small plane crash, leaving the Columbus IMSA race uh, to fly to a, for a short, short thing to come back then for the race on Sunday. Uh, yeah. If you were there, if you were around in the 1980s and were following the sport or in IMSA, in IndyCar, uh, in North American motorsports at all as a fan uh, or someone working, you know that Al Holbert was just a giant, absolute giant. Uh, At the time of his death, he was IMSA's winningest driver, not only in the number of victories, but also uh, the amount of championships that he earned. Also uh, had a great year in IndyCar, uh, raced in Can-Am, raced in stock cars, uh, multiple Le Mans winner, um, (laughs) person who basically took over and created what has become this giant Porsche Motorsports North America empire, ran a Porsche dealership, uh, ran this racing team, did so many other things, was a designer, an engineer, that's all on top of what he did as a driver, the team manager, uh, just a shining example of excellence and uh, mental, mental diversity, uh, dexterity as well with his hands, with his mind, behind a steering wheel, uh, with a ruler, you name it. Uh, that was Al Holbert. He was one of my two and remains one of my two biggest heroes in racing. Al Holbert, Dan Gurney. Uh, the two men whose talent uh, driving whatever vehicles, unbelievable. That's one of the many reasons that I love Al Holbert, but the real reason that he was a huge inspiration to me is for everything off track. And as a young mechanic coming up, and then engineer, and then team manager, and as a person who did a little bit of design stuff, uh, that was playing from the Al Holbert and Dan Gurney playbook. And looking at them, trying to model myself after them, by no means in their league, even the bottom of any league, nowhere near, but just in terms of someone who represented everything I wanted to be, uh, I know I'm not the only one, and I know that I am one of many who, on this 30th anniversary, are uh, thinking heavily about Al, his impact on the sport, and his impact on us. So, wanted to speak with those who might be able to share more about Al, uh, far better than I would be able to, so uh, connected with at the uh, Ren Sport Reunion 6 at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca on Thursday and Friday with three folks, his son Todd Holbert, who I've known for uh, a few years now, but we'd actually never met in person, so that was pretty awesome, I mean, it was genuinely awesome, plus Todd is a spitting image of his father, so it was just, uh, (laughs) for me, like uh, speaking with royalty. Uh, Then with Derek Bell. Al's uh, longtime teammate, Le Mans winning teammate, IMSA everything winning teammate. Um, great, great yarns from Derek. And then closed with Alvin Springer, who was a an incredibly close friend of Al's. Uh, someone who ran the Andile Porsche performance, both uh, streetcar and racing performance uh, house in Southern California, whose engines uh, propelled many Holbert Porsche 962s uh, and otherwise to victories. Uh, Just the two of them were thick as thieves, and Alvin uh, would become a much greater part of Porsche's North American Motorsports um, empire as well. But he and Al were super, super tight. And so I figured these are three men who can bring Al to you in ways that um, I just thought would be very, very fitting. So this man was continues to be and I think will always be just absolute center of my heart of what I do in racing why I do it uh who although I only met him once or twice just as a fan had him sign an autograph or two when I was fairly young um yeah a beacon that I absolutely look towards and uh, am eternally thankful for his his guidance uh, same with Big Eagle, same with my dad, uh, who was an amateur racer, uh, but someone who did many of the same things, was surrounded by amazing, amazing people that helped me uh, do a lot of things that I'm really proud of. So, uh, quite happy to have been able to sit down with these three fine gentlemen, first with Todd, then Derek, and then close with Alvin. Last thing I'll mention is 
as much as I love my uh, my one of my two home tracks at Laguna Seca uh, with their recent move to the a media center in the former Jim Russell School, the Newman Building, there is no such thing as a quiet space. So we had to conduct these uh, first two interviews with Todd and Derek with race cars going on in the background and uh, media roundtables going on. And so, yeah, I look forward to the day when they invest in something so that folks can have actual uh, quiet and isolated interviews. Uh, I hope you can overlook that part. There's absolutely no other option for me there. And we closed with Alvin, uh, who is in... We actually went into the back, the tail of the PMNA uh, parts and support truck. Uh, I was sitting on a little stool. He was sitting on a box. We had our arms propped up on the little workbench there next to the vice. And it was just two old mechanics. Um, obviously, Alvin's my senior and a hero and a legend. Uh, but just two old race car mechanics talking about a guy who we both just loved. Uh, one close, uh, and up close and personal, hand in hand. And uh, one looking through the fence. Uh, just wanting to be uh, at least on the team side, the shop floor side, some sort of version of Al Holbert. So I hope you enjoy this. Thank you again to Cooper Tires for their support, and thank you to Todd, Derek, and Alvin for uh, spending some time to help us celebrate and remember Al 30 years later. Todd Holbert, first of all, you and I have been communicating for a good while on yep. the Internet. I'm so glad to finally yeah, have the chance here. to sit down and meet in person. We're here at Ren Sport Reunion. Sunday is a 30th anniversary of your father's passing. Yep. I know that's not something one would celebrate. Yeah. But I do know that this is definitely a week where I have seen a lot of people celebrate your father. Yeah. Uh, Tom Blattler, former PR man from the, uh, the Porsche team. Uh, did some great work interviewing a lot of folks uh, yeah, as well. So I know there's going to be more tributes and such, but just love to talk about, I guess, at this this anniversary milestone here. What are you seeing and feeling walking around this Ren Sport paddock, knowing that huh. you probably don't like being told this, but to us, you're part of the royalty, brother. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I said to uh, uh, Kevin Doran, our our uh, one of our old crew chiefs earlier today, that um, you know, as I sit here and look around, I, I went to the first Ren Sport with my grandfather, which was really cool. Um, you know, it was a more s- intimate, it was a Lime Rock, a lot smaller, um, not nearly as many uh, fans, if you will, or, um, and, um, and, and that was neat. But as I walk around and see how much this has grown and see how much, um, you know, in the past couple of years, certainly seems like the Porsche brand, um, has, has grown and, and exploded. Um, I said to Kevin, I, I wonder how dad would do it this stuff yeah um you know this the 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 uh outward facing you know uh publicity and pr thing wasn't really his um wasn't really his deal his deal was i want to make my race car faster and i want to win races and um so when you see all of this and and people coming from all over the world and and what a um you know what an important era the the seventies and the eighties were uh, certainly in the sixties and the fifties but um, you know the seventies and and the eighties um, it's uh it's pretty neat to see the contribution later you don't see it in period you you don't really uh understand what it means you know this year or you know, this week or this year. I mean, even growing up as a kid, going to the racetrack, yeah. you're just going racing with your dad. You don't, you're not just, grasping the context. No, uh-uh. no, it was, um, and, and, you know, I, th- I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff that's made it, uh, m- more prevalent, at least for me is, is the, the, the internet and the social media and things like that, where you can see, you know, all these people, uh, 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 that that there was an impact either you know because they watched it or because they interacted sure. or were somehow involved um, it's a really um, it's it's a neat thing to see it's it's um, it makes you look back and appreciate more what you maybe took for granted 
you know, I, I, uh, I told a story a couple weeks ago of um, as I'm going through pictures and stuff, I don't really realize until you sit down and you think about it. One of the, one of the pictures that I had gone through was, was a picture of uh, I got to go to Le Mans in 87. And it was a big deal. I'm going, you know, going to go over to France. But it was, I got to go over to Le Mans. I got to hang out in the uh, Rothmans uh, <laughs> motorhomes. I got to, listen to this, I got to um, hang out with, uh, we stayed at the same hotel with Derek. And, and my thing was I got to eat uh, strawberry sundaes all week with Derek Fres Melbus. Wow. Um, in, in the hotel as we had every meal together. And Derek told me that he, you know, he was, I remember him. A pile of pasta the night before because he was carving up. Yes. That was part of the plan, and um, and then I, they just left me in the paddock for the race. Couldn't go anywhere, you know. Walking down to the Porsche curves and sleeping in the um, uh, in the rental car, um, going into the Rothmans trailer and stuff like that. It's just um, you didn't realize. Uh, you know, it's just an example of how cool that stuff was. And to look back on it now, um, you know, when you see what it means to everybody, you start to appreciate how really cool it was. You were young when you lost your father. I was fortunate in that I was 24 yeah. when I lost mine. Yeah. So still a massive life-altering blow, but I was at least fortunate to be a bit older. Yep. What was your world like because i have to imagine there's the the common bond shared by everyone who's lost a parent but you also had a father who even if it didn't make full sense to you at the time yeah you probably had to realize that oh a lot of people feel like they've lost as well yeah so it was um uh you know for for me you know personally and and um you know your sort of immediate growing up i was 14 um, so you're still being formed and, and, um, uh, you know, the, the big thing for me that stepped in there was my grandfather. Yeah. Um, and that was really because we were close, uh, you know, we we're close in proximity, but, but we were also close and because, um, you know, very similar, uh, to my dad, you know, they both in what they did, uh, you know, the, the dealership managing and the racing and, the, um, but it probably the, the direction, cause I wonder sometimes the direction of where would you have gone if it would have been mm. dad around, you know, I, I, um, I sort of say that he was just starting to, we'd gotten a go-kart, um, from Scotty Pruitt and we're just starting to put that together and he was making me put it all together and, and, um, uh, you know, I did that a little bit, but I think I was probably steered away from the driving and things sort of worked out. I decided I really like to make things and yes. design things. And I went all of that way. I, one of the things I think I like to, uh, I like to say, cause some of the guys on the team that I worked around was, um, that some of the things that, uh, dad was not that great at, like, building things mm. you know um that those clicked for me and i'm uh so i took that path of doing design and and builds um and didn't take the path of driving um and it'd be interesting i quite frankly i'm not sure i'm brave enough to do it <laughs> um when uh, the few times, you know, that was another thing as a kid. I got to ride around and if they were shooting a commercial or something like that, um, ride around in the passenger seat of that thing. And it is terrifying, <laughs> absolutely terrifying. How brilliant. Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, my grandfather would have been, the, you know, the big thing that stepped in. And, and um, you know, I worked uh, when I finished the um, uh, high school and went to college. I worked for uh, IndyCar teams for the summers and um, but, but the, the path shifted a little bit and, and our house was my, my dad didn't bring his work home um, my mother wasn't involved in the racing side like a lot of wives are. When it, before we were born she went to some races um, 
but she, I think she wanted to keep that separate. And uh, so our house was school and friends and the house and normalcy. Uh, no, yep. Normal stuff. And, and so she, you know, because she wasn't in that world, it was, it was a bit of a, um, a bit of a hard stop, I guess. You know, I, I went to, uh, races, like I said, a bit more for fun. I'd go camp out at Lime Rock or the Glen or, mm. um, but it was a bit of a hard stop on the, um, racing path going every week. And, um, and I like that stuff. I mean, we, we I'd take off school Thursdays and Fridays. Uh, we'd get an airplane and we'd fly to the race and I'd take some homework. And when we get to the track, I mean, I grew up at tracks as, you know, the playgrounds. Just, um, uh, you know, you get to road Atlanta and you go run through the woods and into the creek and then come back for practice and, uh, you know, back for the end of the day into the hotel. And, yeah. So you were Al's son growing up. There are obviously so many folks that we know of, whether it's a Derek Bell, a Chip Robinson. Yeah. There's so many people, a Doc Bundy, so many names, famous drivers. Yeah. It could be an Alwyn Springer. Yeah. You know. Tell me about getting to know them as an adult, as your own man. Because sure. they obviously would have known you as a little kid yeah, yeah, yeah. from uh, age zero. Yeah. But one of the things that I love and appreciate... Todd, is that you You have strong bonds and friendships with so many people that were big parts of your family, sure. but I believe they're your own. Yeah, yeah. We, we um, you know, when I flew in here yesterday, uh, got off the plane, and there was a guy standing with a Porsche sign. And I looked at it and said, well, there must be somebody coming down here that's, you know, coming down the escalator behind me. Um, you know, it's important enough that they're, that they're picking up and I turned around and there's EFR Elliot and, and Lynette. Um, and you know, they were ones that we, we grew up. I, I told my wife, I said, look through these pictures. And I went to some pictures of dad racing against Elliot in 72 and in, in 79 and in 86. Wow. And, and we were friends with their family. You know, it was, um, uh, it was, it was a lot of who we were around. I mean, it was, you know, half of dad's life, he had the home part, but the, the um, you know, all those people that you spent all that time around and I spent a lot of time around them. And, um, you know, we, Derek's a good example. Alwyn Springer's a good example. We would go on vacations with them to, um, uh, uh, Disneyland, uh, cl- close to their family. And, and, you know, there's, there's a few particular ones, um, that were a part of my growing up, not because they were fam- you know, famous race car drivers, and, um, but they were really, uh, and, and I think because we shared that, it's neat for me to go back and talk to them now, and, and you know, I have a different perspective, obviously. They're not talking to a 10-year-old, now they're talking to an adult. Um, so we can talk about some of those times, and, and it's like some of them that I haven't seen for years i mean i haven't seen derek probably since ren sport one wow probably walked right up and you know i mean I, I, it's some of them it's funny because i i'm told a lot that i look like dad and so like when i turned around and saw elliot and lynette i just turned around and i said elliot and she looked at me and she went wow Todd. <laughs> yeah. yeah um so that's that's kind of neat. And I've stayed in racing. So, you know, I have a little bit of, um, you know, lifelong common part. I, I, I never really got out of racing. And that's what I, I wanted to close on. We're thinking so much and just uh, so happy about everything that your father achieved in his life and career uh, with this 30-year mark coming up. Mm. But it's also even better that there wasn't that hard stop yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah. That the Holbert name has continued in motor racing. You forged your own now long-standing career. Right. 
tell me about, I don't know if pride is the word, Yeah. but every now and then, rarely, but I'll get someone who used to crew for my dad on yeah. just club weekends, yeah. and they'll see my name, and I'll get it. Are you any relation to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's one of those things where I... I just beam with pride yep. that, wow, someone remembers my Absolutely. dad. I'm, I also take pride that while I was a mechanic and those things, but I'm still in the sport that yes. he loved and, and introduced me to. Would I be safe in assuming that you take pride in knowing that you're continuing this family tradition? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the um, you know, the ones that really, I mean, it means a lot that everybody remembers um you know something about dad there's a lot of people that remember something about my grandfather but the ones that are you know that really mean a lot are the ones that um are, that work in the industry mm. that you hear from um you know a, a a a fan is is great but they've they've got a small window into what's this guy like and so to hear it from the guys that worked with you know that had been around for uh, 30 years or 40 years that we're exposed to all of these legends that we all know. Um, so to talk to the guys that are in racing um, and and hear their perspectives and that they really respected dad um, and, and knowing how hard it is. I mean, being in it uh, uh, to some extent, not the same level, but being in it um, and realizing how difficult and you don't stay involved. in it long if you aren't good at what you do. Sure, and that's one of the other things too is your father's, your grandfather's longevity in the sport. Yeah, you know, there's a reason they only trust me with a keyboard these days. It tells you how good I was with a wrench in my hand. But you, on the other hand, the, the, clearly there's talent in the bloodline that, that well, flowed all the way through. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, but those are neat to hear the stories from people about. Um, uh, you know, of course, I, he's my dad. He's the hero for me. But to hear other people say that from, with their perspective on and, and why that is, um, you know, sort of validates it from a different side. Um, it's, it's, um, it's really neat. It's part of what's cool about coming uh, to this. I've been looking forward to coming to this one because, you know, I don't get to see all these sure. people together. Um, so this has been fun. Thanks for sitting down, brother. Yeah, this is cool. Mr. Bell, we are at a odd place in time where we would not celebrate the 30th anniversary of Al Holbert's loss, but we would certainly take a moment to celebrate all that he meant to those who loved him and knew him. You and I have spent many hours of our life speaking about Al. Yeah. I figured this might be a great time just to start off on 30 years since we haven't had him. Yes. What comes to mind? Uh um, well, Al was just such a special person in so many ways. And I don't think you, like a lot of people in our lives, you don't realize how important they are to you until they're gone. Mm. And uh, I just knew him as a, as a very interesting man in those days. And obviously a great engineer, and a great driver, great test driver, and a great organizer, really. Um, but only when he had gone did you realize just what he had done and mm. what he'd been involved with and what he meant to you. And I must admit, when he, you know, that awful night, like suddenly my American racing career was over, apart from tragically his life, but suddenly in your own selfish way you look and say, my God, not only his family have got the loss, that's the end of my career. Mm. Um, but what, then, of course, you still battle through like the family are, and I'm with Todd this weekend here and his son, who's such a fabulous guy. And you spend time with him, and uh, we get over it all and carry on with our own sort of lives and, and so on. But he was, he, if, I, if you'd ask me, you know, what did he really mean to me? He was the, of all the people who were teammates, he was the greatest all-round teammate I had. And not only because uh, he was a great driver, it's because of his organizing capacity, uh, the way he was always very calm. I mean, he did swear a few times. Which I love that fact. That's a hidden hidden fact yes, for some, despite yes. being a God-fearing man. Yeah. He had some things to repent for as well. That's right, yes. So uh, basically, um, he, w- he was just all round a phenomenal person. But he, you know, he developed the cars, and we were chatting about that with these three t- our crew chiefs just now. And there were some of the tales that came out of you know when I was testing, and I had a massive damn crash 
that sort of thing at, 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 at um, uh, sorry, Sears, Sears Point. Point. And we're just talking and joking about it, in really. But when you think of all we went through and the testing we did and the hard work that but Al put into it. Mm. I mean, I just turned up like a, like a bloody star. The wrong word. I don't mean I was a star, but you'd turn up like a star would and get in the car which had been tested and developed since the last race. And he always said that famous phrase, um, um, you know, that when, uh, you know, you never talk or you look back at the race you had just done. If somebody started to say, well, what, you know, the car was doing this or the car was doing that or if only. And Al would say, as soon as the race is over, the clock goes back to zero. Mm. And it really, he was right. Uh, you don't, it doesn't matter what happened last week. It's what's going to happen next week or at the next race. Outside of his renowned life as a thinker, an innovator, a manager, facilitator, mm. driver, engineer... Al's also known as a man, as having as a multifaceted, multidimensional man. We know in the sport, not everyone is blessed with that distinction. No. Al could be incredibly focused. I know you've also told me he could be incredibly warm. Yes. You've never said the two of you spent day and night just running around having fun that level, but there was there was a bond. What was what, what was that bond? Well, it's strange, isn't it? I think it was just mutual respect. Mm. I mean, I never really realized to what degree he'd raced before I got with him, before we drove that little Carrera GTR at Le Mans, which was... Such an odd start to the odd relationship. Odd start to the relationship. But you see, it didn't mean much to me to race with Al at that point because I just knew him as Al Holbert, American driver. I didn't know much about racing in America then, if you realize, because I hadn't really started my American sure. career. It was just starting in the early 80s, and I was with Bob Aiken in the initial part. But I remember the World Championship was what I was really doing, and that's why I never became American champion with Al, because I had to keep, you know, I had to keep majoring on the World Championship races. Um, but, of course, I now reflect on what I thought of Al at the time, and it was a totally different one to the person I ended up racing with. Hmm. Well, we did Le Mans together, and I, like I said about Jackie Hicks just now, I never talked with him because he was in the car or I was. <laughs> so when would we talk? And he, you know, after the race was so exhausted, I had my family with me, and I'm not sure if he had family with him or not. I know Joy wasn't with him there, but I don't think if the younger family were. And that was it. You know, I mean, he was... Um, he, he, we just went our own sweet way. I mean, you were so exhausted. We stayed at different hotels um, because I always stayed at La Chartre sur le Loire and he stayed with the Porsche team. And then on the Monday, he got on a plane and went back. And I never really spoke with him again until I got the call, would I come and drive? Would I consider driving with him in the uh, Lone Brow Porsche? So you obviously have done moderately okay at Le Mans. I've heard you might have, might have sprayed a little bit of champagne there. But all kidding aside, your European career well before sports cars firmly established yes had you completed that at the end of pick the year 82 83 84 said i'm done we'd still you'd, we'd have as much reverie for you as as we do now yeah but then with al primarily you forged this american chapter yeah. where we got to see the two of you work yes how much did you enjoy that adventure because it seems like IMSA in the 80s with Holbert Racing had to be an adventure. Yeah. Well, I mean, as you rightly say, I mean, I was with the best team in the world anyway in, Ameri in England. In, sorry, in Europe with Porsche, with the 962 and the Rothmans team. So what, more could, what could be better than that? But it was a different sort of culture uh, racing over here. Uh, over there, rather. I keep thinking I'm in Europe. Uh, racing in Europe was just sort of so so different, a different mentality. And, you know, it was all factory-based, so therefore there was no fun in it, although we did have some fun. But uh, there wasn't this lovely, relaxed atmosphere that I picked up when I came to America. And then I realized just, you know, um, how motor racing was part of one's life, whereas uh, motor racing in Europe was the thing you did at weekends. Mm. And over here, you did, over here, it was your life. It was a village life. You're part of a community. And um, I, I, I really appreciated that. It was lovely to come and see the same. And everybody, the only thing that bothered me, I don't think that that point during those first years or two, 
over here was that the Americans, the people that followed it, became, we became part of a community, part of a, a, a circus, if you like. But I don't think that people realized how dangerous it was. Ooh. And I, I just don't think they, I just remember seeing people's comments like going, or reading, not reading, but hearing comments about people. I say, God, they realize we, people die at this. And uh, not that it changed me or in any way, but I remember thinking, you wait till one of these guys dies, and then it's going to change the smile on your mm. sort of community. And I don't mean that in an unpleasant no, way. No, it's, but it's but reality. It's like the reality hadn't really hit here. Yet in all things it must have done, because people were dying through IndyCar a lot. Not much in sports car, thank God, in, in all our lives. But um, I don't think they realized how dangerous it was, you know. And it was, you know, that everybody talks as if it was part of your life to do this and that and the other and then go racing and then see you on Sunday night after. I mean, after, before every damn race I went into in, that, in my life, I, people would say, okay, see you. We used to play squash and I used to play tennis with a group in my hometown. And they'd say, so we'll see you on Monday when you're back from the race, Derek, and see, <coughs> see you there for the... Uh, you know, see you for tennis on Monday, and I'd, under my breath, I'd say if I'm still alive. Mm. And uh, I did through the whole of my career, because was I going to get on the plane and never come back? I never knew that. Now it seemed the Americans didn't think like that at all. So we spent some time this morning. Well, let me rephrase that or start over. You spent this Friday morning driving a glorious Lowenbrow livery nine six two one. Uh, you hadn't. Uh, hadn't been in for quite some time yeah. with Kevin Doran overlooking the car. Todd Holbert came by very much a, a family reunion. you mentioned the family side already, but just looking back at this 30 year mark, is that among the, the greater items that endure the fact that although Al isn't here, this, peerless family of racers his own family yeah. members that created so much success you can step back in and feel like you are part of that family oh yeah i mean that's but that's what ren sports have done so much for us ren sport is the fact that we're all here even seeing you for example and other journalists that come up that you've known over the years and you're all you can all relax sorry you can all relax and, and, and uh, just spend time together. And if you can't do it, you'll, have to, you'll do it later. There's no panic to, do, to, to get on and chat because there's another time later in the day. But I think, you know, to, to be able to associate. I mean, I, when I saw, I, I was chatting with Kevin Duran, um, and then who, who was working with us on the car. And then, lo and behold, up comes, um, up, well, Todd's there too. Todd Holbert's there. And then up comes um, 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 Mike Colucci, yes. who's had a terrible time yes. with a heart problem. So to see him was very special. And then, of course, up comes, um, uh, what's his name from, uh, um, sorry, he was on the IMSA staff, wasn't he? Um, he, was, he came up to us, Tom, Tom Seabolt. Yes. Sorry. Now, Tom was, a, Tom was the first guy I worked with. Then there was Kevin, because Tom went off to work for IMSA. Then Kevin Duran. And then, I'll, then right, my last ever race in the 962, would ever win of a 24 hour race, was in 1989. Oh, was it? Yeah, 89, when we won uh, 24 hours of Daytona. Yes. In the Miller High Life car, which I'm going to get a chance to drive soon, I believe. They're re rebuilding it ple completely. Uh, but. but um, you know, so I had three crew chiefs and Todd Holbert there. I mean, it was just fantastic. And I was just changing in the motorhome. And I went, no, no, I've got to get a picture of this while yeah. these guys are here. I mean, when will it happen again? I mean, you know, Mike Colucci, a month ago, could have been dead mm. after his, during his operation. He would have been if he hadn't had it. You know, Kevin, I have no idea how Kevin is. Kevin <laughs> is Kevin's Kevin. And, um, and of course... Um, you know, to be with Todd was very special because of Al, Al and us. So, and, and say Tom Seabolt, you see once in a blue moon because he's not really that active, at least not where I am. Sure. So to see the three of them and, and then Todd, and, and Todd as well was just, I had to get a picture of it because it's special. And that's what America was to me. We didn't have the same relationship. But one of the reasons I didn't have the same with Porsche is because I didn't speak German. Mm. 
and there were more guys in a team over here. There were six guys on a team, and they were with you the whole year. In certainly, John Wire would alternate his team each race as he did the cars. So we had a different crew alternate alternate races. But also, the Germans all spoke German, and they didn't speak English, and I didn't speak German either. I never did really get to speak much because I didn't sit around on my bum doing nothing all winter. When I could learn German, I was off to Australia, <laughs> New Zealand, and South Africa doing racing there. Let's close on this, Derek. I've asked you this before, probably for something I've written. I don't know if I've asked you this in the audio format, but knowing that we're honoring and remembering Al at mm. this 30-year mark since his loss, for those who were not as fortunate as I am to have grown up idolizing him. Yes. Driver, engineer, yes, you name right. it. He, was, he and Dan Gurney were my yes. two greatest inspirations right. to become a mechanic and so yes. on. For those who weren't fortunate enough to have lived and had that same influence, tell folks about the Al Holbert you know and you think of and all the various talents that he brought to bear. Well, the strange thing is um, I certainly had no idea of that talent when I drove with him at Le Mans because we were both members of the Porsche team. And then don't forget, I mean, he came back in the, late, in the 80s and we're the only two drivers to have ever won Daytona Le Mans, Daytona Le Mans in, in two, two consecutive it's years. Incredible. Nobody's ever done that and nobody probably ever will. Nobody ever talks about it, but I think it's worthy of showing just what a good pairing we were, all right? We had a great hand stuck and we had little Al drive with us and so on. But you But we core. two together were the basis of that success. Oh, so was the team. But, I mean, as drivers. And weren't we lucky, you know, to, to have done that, to have achieved that? But I had no idea of that when I met Al when we did our thing with the 924. As um, far as me, I was concerned, he was a driver who was very quiet. He didn't shout. He, I mean, I, he was a bit of a hell raiser, they say in the books and all the stuff I read about him, he, was, he enjoyed life. It seems that he was very serious, or when he became, uh, you know, sort of, had he really got himself established, he realized to do that, he had to be much more serious. And I think he had to be to do what he had to do, because, I mean, he was completely, you know, certainly single-tracked, single-minded about making sure that car was the best car out there. Hence his word, the clock goes back to zero. And um, we start again for the next race. And he wouldn't tell me very much. He wouldn't openly tell me stuff. He kept a lot to himself. Mm. He wouldn't tell me we're doing this or we're doing that. The only thing he did tell me right at the end was the day that he died, was he said to me, this is the car, the new car, the interim car that you and I are going to drive in the championship next year. Whereas we'd had Chip Robinson with us for at least one year, if not two. But he decided, he, he realized that, he wanted to do that with me, and I was so flattered and honoured because I thought every year you as a driver, you always think it's going to be your last, you know, with the team they're going to see through you. But he had, he, he knew, but he knew what he wanted. The day he died, he knew that we were going to drive together the next year in that new Porsche, and I knew that it was going to be as good as, if not better, than anything else out there. Alvin, we're looking at the 30th anniversary of the loss of Al Holbert on Sunday. I've had the good fortune of sitting down and speaking with his son, Todd, and Derek Bell as well. And knowing how close the two of you were, just as an aside, some of the photos of you and Al back in the day working together, you could just see what looked like two kindred souls. Let's start with 30 years. It seems crazy that he's been gone that long, isn't it? I, 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 it? It's still, if you believe it or not, it's still guilt on my skin. Because I, I remember I was laying in bed. Now, now and I had with Al, and I'm, maybe I'm jumping now, but Al and I developed not only a, a good business relationship, what we developed actually a deep personal relationship. So, and what we would do is we would go on Friday afternoon, practice over, go to the plane on the East Coast races, go in a plane, drive to fly to Pennsylvania, have dinner with the family, Saturday morning, get up, 
go to the racetrack again. So by the first practice, we were there. We've done that many, many times. And then that dreadful night, he had a meeting with some finance guys or something because we were in the process of building a new sports car and we wanted to use the eight-cylinder in the engine converted to a gasoline. So it, it, everything was kind of going on. And he said, you know, like, hey, I still have a meeting and, uh, you know, it will be late. So, you know, no, I said, then I go to bed. And that's why I didn't go with him. And that's faith, you know, fate, fate. You know, like, and then I was laying in bed and the telephone rang and then Ken House from, uh, at that time, was with the Chevrolet, with the Govets, and uh, I, I knew him from the Creepy Crawly days. And then uh, he told me that uh, there's a plane crash, and there's a picture, and I can see, like, the tail end. It looks like Elska, Elsa uh, plane. Sure. And that was then reality. And that, that's really, 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 I don't know. They wanted to ask me some question the next day, and I said, do me a favor. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. So a, a tough, tough, tough loss. Very tough. Left us way too young. Way, way too young. I mentioned this to both Todd and Derek, that we're here at Rensport. Yeah. We're here celebrating all that Porsche is on its 70th anniversary. There are a number of... Holbert racing cars, oh, of course. four cars that Al drove, Absolutely. whatever it might be. We're remembering him this weekend as a part of the celebration, though. What comes to mind just being here, looking through the paddock, seeing some of the things, the little things that uh, remind you of him, that help you remember what an impact he has, because I see Holbert <laughs> seemingly everywhere here. Yeah, it is that is the nature of time. The young people, they don't know any more about L, but that is something you know. Like when, when somebody leaves, if it is you or me, after a certain time, people forget. But the racers, the people who know a little bit about it and get an interest in racing and look a little bit in history because where can you learn? Nothing more than history. They know what it is. And uh, I can only say the, the person like Al, he was actually like, a, maybe I sound a little bit too emotional or whatever. It's a, there is no perfect person on earth. But when I look at him from my perspective, he had it all. He had it all. He had that, uh, what I said before, he had the leadership, he had the knowledge, he had the ability to uh, deal with big people level, the small people, very, very good, and above everything else. He was a hell of a driver. He was not only a good race car driver, but he was the technician. He had like, I think that he earned done to use blood or, mm. or, or talents or whatever because the two of them were very close together. He just had it. He just had it. I have a good story. You know, like, and yeah, he was sometimes, you know, he was upset and he was things, but he calmed down very, very fast. So he was, I think it was in mid-Ohio qualifying. I forgot the year now. So he, he goes out, first lap comes in. And, you know, for everybody... When when the guy comes in in the first level of qualifying, there's something wrong. Yes. And everybody went, ah, shit. So he opens up the door calmly, throws a piece of chain out, chain. closes the door by himself again, goes out, not a word, pole position. That was El Holwood for you. And afterwards, he just said, hey, you know, very calmly, Let's not do that again, or something in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was for me, he was the best, the best. And like I said, when I lost him, or we lost him, it was for me devastating for a long time. And still today, you know, like, uh, I mean, that's emotional now, but that's what, what I do every year. I have uh, Bob Wollek. I have John Winter, I have Al Horvath, every Christmas, 
a picture from them are standing right beside the Christmas tree mm. in remembrance because you never forget and that I don't do and that was Todd Holbert Derek Bell and Alvin Springer sharing some love and some thoughts about the great 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 Al Holbert I hope you enjoyed what we had to offer here and uh, I'm sure you also know that there's some sensitivities involved obviously with Todd also with Derek uh, and even with Alvin, who, as you could hear, and as we closed, um, he definitely wears that uh, that loss with him still, despite many decades passing on. All right, I'm Marshall Pruitt. This is the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, presented by Cooper Tires. Thank you for listening. <laughs>